Thank you, Greg. Well, um, preachers always say when they're visiting somewhere, they say, well, it's, it's great to be here this morning. But it really is, you know, we, our folks at home and uh, at Faith Baptist in Auckland, we, we have quite a, a spiritual and emotional investment in you guys and uh, prayed for you, especially while we were waiting for the Lord to send Daniel to you. And, uh, and so it really is lovely to see you this morning. And, um, and we, uh, yeah, we expect the Lord to bless you here as he has blessed us. Uh, you know, we, our only desire is that he would, that he would be a head of all things to the church. Yes, we desire none but him. Amen. And he is so faithful and so good. Well, let's open our Bibles this morning to uh, Psalm 139. <clears throat> I guess you would probably be somewhat familiar with that. But uh, let's just read the first six verses of Psalm 139, and uh, with God's help, that will be our our meditation this morning. Let's just read that. Where David says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. All right, let's just bow our heads for a moment. Father, Lord, we thank you for your precious word this morning. And Lord, the, we desire to, uh, to hear it. Lord, we... We know that we all come to Sunday morning perhaps dragging along a life full of issues and things behind us, but Father, we pray that you give us grace, Lord, this morning to set those things aside. And Lord, pray that you would indeed speak to us this morning. We thank you for this, this wonderful word of God which never grows old. And uh, Father, the... Uh, the way in which it has touched millions of lives over the years. Father, this is what we covet this morning too. And so, Father, we pray that you would lead us this morning. And, Lord, that uh, at the conclusion of it all, Father, we'd all be glad that we were here this morning. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, I guess various people, you know, over the years, from ancient Jews through to modern Christians, have, have kind of expressed the feeling that, uh, that this 139 psalm is the most sublime of all the psalms and uh, I guess you've got to be very careful saying things like that. Uh, if you're anything like me, you probably, every time your heart is touched by something you read in the scriptures, you say, surely this is the loveliest thing in all the Bible. But of course, everything that you find between the covers of your Bible is, is, is pure and, uh, and precious and necessary. Everything that, that is there. And uh, yet, uh, when a believer meditates on this psalm, it, we are drawn into the deepest thoughts that we can have about God. And, and you know, it, it informs us, if we are believers, it informs us in such a way as we want to flee from our sins and submit ourselves wholly to him, at least. That's the effect it has on me and I. I'm sure you too. And uh, you see, this, this uh, psalm provokes us to reflect upon, in a profound way upon the nature of God and about our relationship with him. Uh, and, and as you read it, it, it brings into sharp focus his infinite greatness. It's wonderful. And our own smallness as creatures is somewhat like the joy that I feel in the midst of a lightning storm which is one of my favorite things in life. Uh, you know, it, it frightens the dog, but it fills me with joy uh, to hear you know, when the thunder makes the ground tremble under my feet. 
and and it's it's lovely you know it makes me realize how small i am and and i'm comforted when nature proclaims the real scale of things and that god is on his throne and that i'm at his feet and it's it's wonderful and so if you were to continue meditating on this psalm uh you would find that it is uh, this this uh, psalm of 24 verses is divided neatly into six into four sections of six verses each and the first one deals with the fact that god knows us and the second set of six verses speaks about how god surrounds us and the third set uh, or at least how he and then the third set speaks about how he made us and the last set speaks about how he judges us. Well, of course, we only have time for that first little section this morning, but it is lovely. The fact that God knows us, he knows us more profoundly than we can ever imagine. And just to dwell upon that is, is, is wonderful. It's good for us. Now, you know, one of the most remarkable things about human beings, about you and I, as compared to the animals, is the fact that we are self-aware. That is to say, we are conscious of ourself. We meditate on ourself. We examine ourself. We think about. Um, we evaluate ourselves. You know, there's no evidence that animals do that. You know, the cat doesn't think about the fact that she's a cat. She doesn't even know she's a cat. She just knows she's here, in the present. Um, our, our little dog, uh, Rosie, she, she doesn't worry that she might have bad breath or, or fret over the fact that she's not taller than she is or anything like that. You know, she, she just is, you know. That's about all there is to a dog's life, I think, as long as she's comfortable and, and, uh, and so forth. See, so, uh, you know, for, for 100 years or so, of course, evolutionists have been trying to maintain this, this kind of uh, oneness of humans and the animals by trying to show that that animals really are self-aware, but it's been a pretty futile business. And I'm trying to establish that. Um, but you, know, um, uh, you know, there's no sign, for example, of any religious impulse among the animals. I think that some animals, if they have, were to have such an impulse, that they're smart enough, you know, but it, but it doesn't exist. Uh, whereas some form of religion is absolutely universal among all people. Wherever you go on the earth, there's religion of some kind. It takes all sorts of different forms, but of course it's there because, because people, and you, you remember yourself when you were three or four years old, you used to roam around wondering, why am I here? Where did I come from? It's just this natural thing we want to know. What's my purpose, you know? Uh, such things as that. And so... Man is religious by nature because he or she craves answers to these questions. Do I matter? You know, where do I come from? What's my, the reason for my being here, you see? And so it is the self-awareness that sets us apart. But even so, that self-awareness that each of us have is very limited. You know, there are the things about me that you see even though you may have only just met me, but there are things about me which you probably see more clearly than I do. Uh, yes, that's especially true of my faults. You know, if I were a boastful person, I probably don't see myself that way, though you certainly would, and I would see it clearly in somebody else. But you know, that, that, that looking at us from the outside, we see certain things, don't we? And Robert Burns, the poet, you know, he said, uh, what's some power, the gifty gears, to see ourselves as others see us. Uh, you know, and uh, that simple thought is quite profound, really. Um, it'd fill in a lot of gaps in, in what I know about myself. But there's still, there's still, even so, even if I were to see myself through your eyes, there's still many things I wouldn't say, I wouldn't see, at least. Because you remember what God said to Samuel. He said, for man looketh upon the outward appearance, but God looketh upon the heart. And uh, you see, that there's, there's another being who understands the very depths of your soul, everything about you in ways that you cannot see or comprehend yourself. He knows you with this amazing completeness and, uh, completeness, and he, he understands far better than I do why I do what I do. 
He knows all these impulses, the secret thoughts of my heart. Um, in Hebrews 4.13, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Isn't that a lovely turn of phrase? Yeah, it's true. It's true. And you see, it is the God-fearing man the God-fearing man or woman who understands this, as David understood this, as he wrote these words, you see, that God knows us. And so, just looking at that text this morning, I'd just briefly like to look, first of all, at the fact that God knows all men, not just some, but all of us. You notice first verse says, O Lord, thou hast searched me, and known me. Now, when David writes this, he does not mean that this is simply his testimony. This is not just true concerning him, because you notice that the, the psalm, if you have written in your Bible, as I do, it says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. Right? In other words, this psalm was intended to be set to music and sung by the congregation. That was its purpose for public worship. And so, the entire assembly, the entire congregation was to sing these words, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. You see, it was not just David's personal testimony, but it was for everybody. It's for everybody here this morning. And you know, like all good hymns, this psalm was written to teach us about God and about our relationship with him and his way with us. That's, that's why what we sing is, uh, is so important. Um, it was many, many years ago. Perhaps, I don't know how long ago, but I went to um, Trinity Baptist and they were meeting in a high school way over in, I don't even know where you call that place, over Frankton Way somewhere, and they had written in the front of their hymnal a little message says the theology of the local church is determined by the music it sings something like that and that's so true you know if if, if a church sings um, shallow thoughtless uh, hymns or songs uh, then unfortunately that church will tend to produce shallow thoughtless Christians because so much of the things that we believe that are really important to us are anchored in our hearts through what we sing together on, uh, on the Lord's Day morning, together. It, it has a, a huge effect on us. And uh, the, the, in our hymn, our hymn book at home, um, some, some, there's some hymns in there I would gladly take a pen knife to, quite honestly. Uh, you know, it does, just the fact that they're old doesn't mean they're good. There's been some lovely hymns written in, new, in recent times as well. But, um, but you know, as... Uh, the question is, do they accurately reflect the word of God and the things that we sing? That's so important, isn't it? So David says, thou hast searched me and known, uh, known me. And, uh, you know, how, how holy and how worshipful our meetings are when everybody here in this room is aware of the truth of that. That here I sit this morning and God knows me. He knows all there is to know that, that each one of us would know that our hearts are laid bare before him when we meet together. You know, you think of the, you know, the hypocrisy and the formalism and the, the sort of insincere religious habits that we tend to pick up over time. We just, we just do this, you know. Those things are cast out by the simple realisation that as I sit here this morning, God knows me. He knows me. And, and you know, in our witness to our family and friends and the people we long to see come to Christ. This too is something to be emphasized with them, that to remind them that God sees right through all of us, all our pretended righteousness and the, the, the virtues we imagine we have which somehow offset our sins. These things are known to him. They, they are before the all-seeing eye of the one who made us and who knows all men. You know, the last verse in the book of Ecclesiastes says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It shall be. And, and, uh, and so 
it's not only that he knows all of all of us, but also let's notice secondly there that that he knows all men constantly. It's a it's it's you know twenty four seven as they say. It's it's moment by moment. He verse two says, Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising, thou understandest my thought afar off. Um, he knows us at all times, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whether we're awake, whether we're asleep, whatever it is that's occupying us at the time. And then verse 3 says, Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. Now, I don't know what translation you use, but that word compassest there is, would literally be uh, Winnow to winnow, you know the way that the farmer separates the grain from the, the from the chaff, you know, and he separates it out. He shakes it up and so forth and sifts it out. Okay, and uh, God sifts and discerns the good from the evil in everything that we do. You see, He examines and He weighs everything to do. There, you know, there is nothing in our lives. Nothing that we think or do, no decision we make, no act we perform, which is morally, morally neutral. Um, you know, just because something is not glaringly wicked does not mean that God is not concerned about it. He's concerned about absolutely everything. It may, he makes it his business to be acquainted with all our ways, everything. There's nothing he does not care about. He doesn't confine himself to, to um, things in heaven as though he doesn't think about anything else. No. No. Um, Calvin said, Though we live at a great distance from him, yet he is not far from us. Yeah. That's true. And so it's significant, isn't it? Paul's quoting a pagan um, in Acts 17 when he says for in him we live and move and have our being in other words he sustains you every breath you take yeah? all that wonderful digestive system that's working on your breakfast right now and all of those things you know it's, it's all it's not like you know he didn't it's not like a clockwork toy he wound up the spring and just set it on its way no, no moment by moment uh, I'm kept in his love we sometimes sing don't we yeah and so, you know, uh, that's true for every human. He's the sustainer of life in every, every place, every circumstance. You know, God is always aware of, of where we are, what we're thinking, what we're doing, and, and, uh, and there's no action of ours which is not recorded against that day. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And, uh, you know, for, for believers, there are eternal consequences for what we do. Uh, you know, that sort of shallow form of evangelism that kind of says, well, now I've asked Jesus into my heart, I... I don't have to think about anything much here, but I just kind of ride this train until I get to heaven. But, but it's not so. And for those who are unsaved, in, in Revelation 20, verse 12, he says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Because the Lord knows everything that we're doing moment by moment. He, he knows not only what we do or why we do it, whenever we do it, but he knows these things constantly, constantly. Now, um, thirdly, God knows all men absolutely and completely. The end of verse 2 says, Thou understandest my thought afar off. And, you know, we see things in the Gospels, like in, in Luke uh, 7, um, verse 39 says now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it he says it's, he spake within himself as we do yes you have your thoughts he spake within himself saying this man if he were a prophet would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him for she is a sinner 
Verse 40 says, And Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Jesus answered something that Simon hadn't spoken aloud, but had thought in his, in his mind, you see. Because that's verse 4 of our text says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. You know, God knows not just the future events like wars and you know, disasters and such things as that, but he knows the future concerning you and me also in complete detail. He knows what you will do tomorrow. He knows where you will be and what you will think a year from now. He knows these things. And usually when we, when we see something uh, like that done, we assume it's some kind of a trick. You have this magician on the stage and we know there's a plant in the audience somewhere so he can pretend like he knows something about this person and so forth. But um, Stephen Charnock, he said, our knowledge depends on the object, which what that means is for you to know about yourself, there first has to be a self. I and mean, you couldn't know anything about you unless you first existed. That's kind of basic, isn't it? But our existence depends on God's prior knowledge. That we could not have existed unless God knew about us before we existed. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Unless God first knew it. Verse 16 of our psalm says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in, all, and, and in thy book all my members were written, which were in continuance, were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And that's true physically, spiritually, morally, everything that you would be, God knew. And in accordance with what he knew, he made you thus. And moreover, the knowledge that he has of you and me is clear and it's complete. You know, and it's something which is never true for us in this life. You, you know, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, um, Let's see, verse 9 says, For now, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. We know something, but lots of things we don't. But in verse 12 says, you know, King James says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but it you know, has the idea of looking in a dirty mirror, and you don't see your reflection very clearly uh, in that, you see. But, oh, there's a glorious day coming, you know. Because he says, but then, gee, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Wonderful. Wonderful in that day to come. You see, at the present, we, uh, if, we, if we are saved, then we are, Romans 8, 29, says we are being conformed to the image of Jesus. You know, this God's plan is to make you like Jesus. But there's still much of the old man in us, you know. That remaining corruption of the old man is still there. And you know, Jeremiah 79 says that, that the heart is, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And we say, well, I'm glad I left that behind. Well, not entirely, you know. Oh, didn't you ever catch yourself thinking things? as a you disgusting mutt. What are you doing thinking a thing like that? You know? Yeah, yeah. So this is something that, uh, this process of being made like Jesus, but it's not there yet. So we see how, how dependent we are. We're so dependent on this one who knows us so completely and perfectly, and he's the only one who is fit to guide us. If we have any sense at all, we will, we will surrender ourselves as completely as we can to him and say, Lord, I'm not fit to be in control of my life, and I don't want to be, I want you to be in control of my life. Yeah. And as a church, just you know, encouraging one another in this way and praying for one another in this way. And so, then I guess just uh, when you just think about um, the practical ways in which that reality of God's knowledge should affect our lives, it, it first of all, of course, should humble us. You know, our intellectual pride, which I guess has always been our besetting sin, 
Verse 6 of our text says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Um, you know, uh, for all our cleverness, uh, the, the sum of what we know is almost nothing compared to what we don't know. <laughs> you know, and uh, pride makes such fools of us. We, you know, the religion of the modern man often seems to be science. You know, if some guy in a lab coat said it, well, he's the high priest, and so it must be so. But, uh, you know, uh, seems a bit like a puddle boasting to the Pacific Ocean to me, really. Um, but still. Um, our familiar with this psalm brings us to our senses is that um, the, let's see the death, end of Romans 11 where Paul says oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counsellor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, it's lovely. See, well, also the reading what David says here should restrain us from sin. You know how often it is for us all. There have been times for you and me when we behaved ourselves because we knew somebody was looking. Yeah, <laughs> I better not do that because that person over there is going to see me. Yeah. Well, what about the truth that the all-seeing eye of God sees you? Yeah. What about that? Those those first stirrings of some evil desire within you, even there before you do anything, are known by him. You know, we, we speak of such things as, as secret sins, you know. There's no such thing as a secret sin. You know, those things that we, that we do in a corner somewhere, they're not secret. No, not at all. So may God give us grace to remember these things. It reminds us too when we think of this, the omniscience of God, the fact that he knows us the way he does, is, is it, it, we cannot justify ourselves in his, in his sight. You know, of we, we, course, we do that, don't we? We, we, we uh, emphasize our virtues and we ignore our faults and, and uh, it's just the way we are. Um, and, or, or of course we imagine that somehow those, the, the record of those things that we have done will somehow fade with time and eventually disappear from view do you know nothing but the blood of Jesus can do that what can wash my sins away nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus it's so true uh, just over the page in Psalm 143 and verse 2, David says, And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Yeah. No, remembering that, that God knows us the way that he does will cause us to depend upon the, upon the blood of Jesus Christ, upon, his, upon the, the robe of his righteousness. Yeah. What, that, that sneaky, you know, I always say to people, you know, we, we are all legalists by nature. It's our default position. We somehow imagine God will accept us because of something we have did and we've done, excuse me. Yeah? No. No. Now, remembering everything, God knows everything about us, we, we, we have no hope but the fact that we are justified through faith in Christ alone. And, uh, of course, the opposite side of the, the coin to that, perhaps, is the fact that this, this knowledge that God has of us comforts us when we are falsely accused. Sometimes people do that. 
you, you, you know, you may have some recent recollection of something somebody accused you of and it's still raw because it was so unfair. You know, but uh, in Job, uh, Job 16, verse 19, Job says, because you know Job's deal, like he was <laughs> falsely accused by his so-called friends, and he said, also now, that's chapter 16, verse 19 of Job, and also now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and my record is on high. My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. Yeah. And then, fifthly, and finally, uh, I think, uh, that God's knowledge of all men, the fact that he knows us, every human being so completely, is the guarantee of Christ's victory. Yes? He's coming. He's coming. Um, I, I cannot... It astounds me to see the things going on in the world today and how readily they reference with the things in Scripture. Um, the consequences of defying Almighty God and what will happen to us. And we see it. But you know, all the conniving schemes of God's enemies are known to him. All the strategies of the wicked rulers of our day, all these things, they think that they're going to manipulate the world and everything. Well, God knew about those things before they even thought of them themselves. You see, their, their most subtle methods and secret plans can't surprise him. And judgment for those people was prepared before they were born. You know, and so, verse 17 of our psalm then. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And um, how, how wonderful it is and how glad we are to be able to say, and in Psalm 40, David says, But I am poor and needy, and yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? All the teeming billions in the world, just the, the mass of humanity. And yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Yeah. It's wonderful. So to, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? To know and to be known by our Lord and our King. Amen? Yes? It should drive us to the Lord Jesus. We have nowhere else to hide. Yes? But to go to Him, He said, I will remember their iniquities no more. Yeah. So, let us pray. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we rejoice in who You are. Oh, Father, we know that, that men like to construct a little God who's just a little bit bigger than themselves. But, Lord, we rejoice in you, the infinite one. And, Lord, that, that such an infinite one as you are should be gracious to us. Our Lord... Pray, Father, that, that you would help us. It just seems sometimes, oh Lord, that the world is so full of foolishness. But Lord, we pray that you'd give us grace to stand in awe of you. Lord, I, and I look around and see the young people here who are so um, targeted, Father, by the world that would ensnare their thoughts and addict them to the most silly things. But Lord, that our young people, oh Father, might, might be, Lord, at a young age, that they, might, that they might become, Lord, those giants who fear God, who are aware of his constant presence, Lord, beside them. And knowing, Lord, that everything they do, they must give account of to him. And to know, Lord, that this infinite God loves them 
with a love that cannot be measured. All these things. Father, Lord, help us, dear Lord, that we might be, Father, uh, uh, edifying one another day by day. Lord Jesus, until you come. In my lovely name we pray. Amen.